Ils sont trop rapides, ils sont trop rapides. On a encore... We still have 15 minutes to go. C'est le pré-événement. Est-ce que les gens comprennent la parole depuis le pupitre Oui, Ou... deux là. Et... Les non. deux que vous voyez là. Deux là, 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 là. Ah oui, ok. Bah, C'est pour savoir si je Non, non, pas, pas de tout de Tu peux contrôler YouTube Attends, je contrôle le YouTube.
We told him that you are not using. We told him that you will be speaking the two from there. I told him that you are not using those mics, but only the two there. Yes, those. Yes, everything. When I speak here, the mic. front of your mouth. Not too close, but if you speak like that, it's enough. Put it on and we can test. Put it on. Put it on. You need to speak. No, put on. It's not on. You need... My I need the sound to be high because of the light here. Tu peux mettre haut le son. C'est qui qui a baissé le son Non, c'est bon. Parce que c'est là et là. Do you see what do you see now? You see? So
Jan. They need the yeah. armor. Les tableaux en moins devraient entrer avec eux.
Пожалуйста, Алис. Thank you. 
It's a synthesis process of chiron it, it creates process you don't want. It's not a reversible process. So when we talk about classics, if you try and pyrolyze classics, you don't go back to the classic precursors. You get new, unwanted molecules. It's polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. In, in vernacular of gasification pyrolysis, it's called TAM. Many of these are highly toxic. So, 100 years ago, they tried to manage this. And they found that it could only be achieved using very homogeneous types of feedstock. So, lignocellulosic wood, rice husk, and also coal and coke. But even then, you needed a special type of reactor. And you needed a complex, non standard gas cleanup tray, shown here in the picture with the red, red band around it. And what was known 100 years ago, that these systems could not operate with heterogeneous or amorphous materials, so that's plastic. This was tried, by the way, like I mentioned, tried before the 1950s, they knew it couldn't work. It, it, it's to do with mass and heat transfer inside the reactor. It clogs inside the reactor. You need heat, gas transfer to crack the towers, to crack the gases. And it's very, very sensitive. Let's look at solvent-based technology now. So again, remember that these are groupings which there's no consensus. I mean, it's a broad range of concepts. These, many of these operate at high temperatures, so we don't have to realize this, but these need to be required at high temperatures. And they're highly solvent specific. So what you've got is a solvent which attacks the plastic, or attacks, in some cases, a specific monomer. So monomer is a, is a single unit plastic, plastic made of polymers, combined with long chains of chemicals. So this produces a large amount of toxic. Ways, toxic, stem toxic solvent. And the plastic contains toxins, they go into this solvent product. So this, this has been the cause of commercial closures, because you try to manage these toxic solvents. <coughs> so, environmental impacts. These technologies are high in energy intensity, so they're what are called endothermic processes. They require energy to make them operate. And you still see um, technology providers saying these are green, environmental friendly and renewable. They're not. That they are energy consuming. You cannot operate them without high inputs of fossil fuels. If you want to operate with renewables, you need diesel oil, you need natural gas or shale gas. And so they've got high carbon emissions. And that's not, not, just, not, not just the whole system, that's just the pyrolysis unit. So on top of this, you've got the Extremely complex, non standard cleaning up of the tar, tarry wastewater and tarry gas that comes out of them. Now, these produce toxins, as we said, is produced by pyrolysis, nitrates and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, heterocyclic PAHs, which contain other substances, and in addition to this, you've got toxins which are inherently within plastic. These have got to come out somewhere, so they, they come out in the effluent, in the waste solvents, in the, in the gas, they come out in the char, in the pyrolysis chamber, and if these materials are burned, they become emissions to the atmosphere. See a quote here from 1997, pyrolysis oil should not be used as an energy source. This paper was, was referred specifically to dioxins. Dioxins form in greater quantities in pyrolysis than they do in incineration. I think so I've probably gone over most of this. Uh, well, most of the molecules are produced, and this produces large waste streams. Okay, this, is a, this is a paper from this year, uh, looking at pyrolysis oils as, as, as feedstocks for seed crackers. And seed crackers is what you will need to do to try and clean up the pyrolysis oil or gas to make it into a precursor for a new plastic or into a fuel. This is a quote here. All these contaminants are those cause corrosion issues 
increase cold formation, destroy expensive reactions, or deactivate catalysts. In a nutshell, the quality of crude plastic pyrolysis soils is unacceptable as a feedstock for industrial sea crackers. And what the paper said was that many of the technologies needed to try and clean up these toxins haven't been invented yet. So that gives you a straightforward appraisal of both the status of this technology and the challenges that they're facing. Uh, this is a comment so I showed you that the, the toxins in both solvent based and thermals. So look at the quote there about heavy metals, the contaminants. These are plastics, they use as additives to plastics. They come out with this offer uh, from 2010. He said that the, the child was classified as both hazardous and eco toxic. So when you consider these technologies, so we've got the status. We've also got the waste streams that they produce. This is something we've ever talked about in the media. The two quotes on the other side there, quote number one from Shield, this is 2020. You mentioned what I said earlier that the presence of these substances are banned in many countries, and this has been the primary cause of plant corrosion. He also describes how the pollen toxins, such as salic esters, transfer into the soil. So, Using large amounts of solvents and solvents and hazardous waste. So, energy. Okay, so um, see the quote there, this is from a paper in 2013. No chemical recycling technology can offer a net positive energy balance, even if the products like it's burned for energy. It's, 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 it used to be more common, but it still occurs that. Technology providers say that these plants can operate on their own gas. I wrote a journal paper on this, refuting it, it's not possible, it breaches the second law of thermodynamics. And not only that, if you're trying to use the gas because it's a power plant, then you're not going to make any plastics out of it, are you? This is showing the leak, the leak the circular economy in plastics. So they're energy consuming, and little plastic makes the round trip. As you can see in the way, this is the National Resources Defense Council. Now they review the chemical recycling facilities in the UK. So people may be thinking, well, hang on, if, if this is Andrew saying all this, what about all these plants that operate? Well, they don't recycle much, much plastic, if any at all. What happens is, it's energy intensive, they use lots of natural gas, diesel, and the products are so poor quality. They just get burned. So the National Resources Defence Council, they analyse this. Many of the majority of the facilities are not recycling any plastics. They generate large quantities of hazardous waste and they release their food. This again is their same paper, they call it recycling lines. One plant in particular, actually 500,000 pounds of hazardous waste reports for one site alone. And it lists the hazardous substances like carbon, silicon, chromium, etc. And of the other plants, the, the, the hazards were cyanide, solid mercury, acid. These are all present in plastics. And as mentioned in the previous slide, they've got to go somewhere. This leads to the need to comply with hazardous chemicals legislation, and it leads to plant closure. And the concern is that if these technologies, which they are, they are being promoted in developing countries, then there is less stringent legislation. It's an environmental disaster waiting to happen. Okay, this is so relevant. It's recently this year. The US Attorney General has launched an investigation into public disinformation over decades by the petrochemicals industry. This is industry. Uh, this is the chemist this year, 2022, is the executive of the Olea. They're not, they don't want to touch plastic uh, recycling, pyrolysis plants. The pellet yield is only around 22% of the input material. It's got a significantly larger carbon footprint than virgin plastic production. And the other one there in black. It's against this from industry. It's optimistic to suggest that chemical recycling will become a viable outlet for waste plastics in the net 
So why is chemical recycling being promoted? I touched on this in a previous slide. It's not because of any technical merits, it's because mechanical recycling has problems. There's no evidence that chemical recycling is environmentally sound. All evidence is to the contrary. The energy balance is negative, so in addition to the local and environmental human health impacts, we've got to consider the climate. There's been 50 years of commercial failure of this technology. It's stagnated rather than developed. Large quantities of toxic residues are produced. These toxins go into the products and the byproducts. The operating facilities, all they claim to be plastic to plastic, they recycle little or no plastics. And here is, here is the answer. It's locks us into decades of more fossil fuel consumption. And this is why it's been heavily promoted by the petrochemicals industry. Well, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You can contact me at the email address given on the slide. Or uh, you can contact Gaia, or Gaia has a number of publications on chemical recycling.
a range of contaminants which require a high degree of further cleanup. And there is also gas, but I'll go into that. Uh, the other type of uh, chemical recycling is known as chemical depolymerization. Uh, and this process is essentially the opposite of the initial polymerization and produces single polymer uh, molecules or even shorter fragments of oligomers. The process only operates sufficiently with highly selective inputs requiring careful source segregation uh, and is believed to be suited to PET uh, and a range of other plastic polymers, but only if they're very, very uh, clean and sort of separated. And as with most chemical recycling technology, toxicity, fake characteristics and residues created by decontaminated monomers has not been made public. There is very, very little literature available. You've seen some of it previously, but it's hard to find. The hazards associated with the proprietary catalysts used in depolymerization uh, are, have not been disclosed. Solvolysis is a little bit different. And involves the purification process based on dissolving polymers in solvents, separating the contaminants, the contaminants and reconstituting the target polymer. Uh, in general, it works by dissolving the polymer in a specific proprietary solvent, followed by the removal of contaminants, uh, which are the toxic additives uh, added after polymers have been made uh, at, at the most basic level. And they include things like pigments uh, and non intentionally added substances, uh, stabilizers, colorants, and so on. Uh, and then we move through filtration, phase extraction, and precipitation of the polymer using an anti solvent in which the polymer, the polymer is insoluble. Its main application was developed to remove brominated flame retardants and other additives from polystyrene, allowing the target polymers to be purified and used as direct feedstock into new polystyrene production. Uh, this is very different to those other technologies discussed previously, and, and it can be supported uh, and it is uh, a good process. But it also does have the waste stream generated by removing those additives from the target polymers, especially in large volumes of process. Uh, and it should be limited to polystyrene, uh, for which it was first intended, and not used for other types of plastic waste. So, why is it being promoted as this whole chemical recycling push to, as a solution to the plastic, global plastic waste solution? Uh, it's been promoted because the fossil fuel industry is being forced to pivot away from fuel manufacture due to their carbon liabilities uh, and are shifting their fuels into plastic production. Mechanical recycling of plastic was heavily promoted in the 1980s when plastic manufacturers were last under pressure over their plastic pollution. Um, although for a long time people were of the view that it was uh, successful, uh, it was actually a failure uh, and it only managed to uh, recycle around 9% of all the plastic ever produced. The rest has either been dumped or incinerated. Plastic producers don't want limits imposed on plastic production, but cannot now claim that mechanical recycling will resolve the crisis. And so they're vigorously promoting chemical recycling as a solution that will allow plastic production profits to continue unabated. The toxic additives in plastics uh, become a plastic that end up becoming part of the plastic waste generated from large scale. Uh, hazardous waste streams and chemical recycling. They're represented by the little red dots there in the PVC molecules. They're, they're not bound into the polymer, they're an additive that uh, it can leach out of the material. So most plastics contain these chemical additives, including pots, and they may have functions as colorants or UV stabilizers or plasticizers or fillers. And the additives here go on to contaminate the output of the pyrolysis and gasification plants, all become part of the hazardous waste stream. The more the outputs of the process are purified, the more hazardous waste is generated as solid waste for emissions or waste. The useful output of hydrocarbon chemicals from the process is going to be oils or waxes or synthetic gases. And in most cases, the outputs are too contaminated to be used directly as feedstock. Uh, they are often too contaminated to be used as fuels. But with further highly expensive cleanup, they can be used as low grade fuels. It's very expensive to clean them to the point they can be used as chemical feedstock, and this affects their viability in the market, particularly when competing with virgin plastics. So, is it really viable? I covered this issue in detail with my co author, Professor Takada, in this document, Plastic Waste Management Hazards, and that's available from the link uh, on the ICANN website. 
And we argue that chemical recycling, and particularly for all the system gasification, is not viable due to its inability to compete with virtual plastics on an economic basis because of the cost of filtering out those chemical additives in the primary treatment and subsequent costs of post-treatment purification. It has very low yields and a high hazardous waste disposal costs associated with it. It has extremely high energy consumption costs and carbon footprint. Uh, and it needs uh, relatively clean homogenous plastic inputs to function. The cost of emission controls and compliance uh, can be high if they're properly regulated, and of course there's the associated environmental impacts that come from that. Billions are being invested by plastic companies who need to be seen to have a, a solution to plastic pollution to avoid these production limits. We've seen the work of the Alliance on Plastic Waste, uh, which is represented by many uh, plastic production and uh, consumer goods uh, corporations around the world, uh, uh, including uh, Exxon, Dow, Shell, Chevron Phillips, and so on. And they committed to spending over uh, 1.5 billion in the next five years, uh, largely promoting uh, this technology. And there's more money. There's an enormous amount of money that's been spent to try and convince the world that chemical recycling is the solution to the problem of plastic waste. Uh, and that we don't need to cap production. The European government, however, is not convinced in, and in one of the more detailed analysis of the sector, said there is significant uncertainty about whether the building process infrastructure to recycle plastics will actually lead to new materials or only to fuels. And if this will, then such a linear lobbying is clearly not in line with the basic principles of the circular economy and is one of the major concerns when considering the role of policies in the plastic system. Journalists are even less uh, convinced by the uh, promotion of this material. Workers conducted an in-depth exclusive and found that many of the plants were either not operational, uh, were having commercial difficulties, or had fallen uh, altogether. Low quality contaminated outputs that are expensive to decontaminate uh, are at the heart of the problem of the industry. Using mixed inputs of plastic waste has been demonstrated to generate a range of toxic emissions in the outputs. Emis uh, in, sorry, in emissions in fuel oils, in carbon, and other products, uh, including the quantification of the toxicity rate of dioxin from propolysis was three times the input material at full operational performance and 11 times the input at the pilot step, and the toxins are present in both the gas and oil. However, that hasn't stopped uh, ongoing promotion of this technology. And one of the ways to look at what the potential waste stream could be uh, from chemical recycling is to look at the plastic additive market globally. And what we see is various estimates, but it's around 4 to 6 percent uh, cumulative annual growth rate, uh, which represents a, a massive waste stream if chemical recycling is to be widely adopted because of the uh, I'll just jump a couple here and I'll go back to those previous slides. But if we look at the actual amount involved, it's around 100 million tons of additives are predicted to be produced between 2020 and 2025. And if we were to convert everything to chemical recycling and plastic, that would represent the waste stream for those five years. It's an enormous amount. Uh, just uh, tracking back a little. Uh, major waste industries that handle waste seem to understand this. The Biolia, that was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, an $8 billion global waste management company, uh, has dropped paralysis. It rejects chemical recycling and plastic waste. Uh, and in Germany, one of their managing directors said that this is precisely the risk for our industry. Without proof of safe, reliable, and sustainable mode of operation on an industrial scale, without a transparent database for life cycle analysis, from sources that are neutral uh, as possible, and without con critical consideration of the proven and the new, we run the risk of being used as a skill holder for a vision of the chemical industry. From the sequence of process steps in chemical recycling, the result was a material pellet yield of only about 22% for uh, PET uh, plastic. Uh, and so you can see, uh, just jumping, oops, I'm sorry. Just jumping ahead there, Bayalia has pulled out because you can see the commercial realities is that they're dealing with very large amounts of waste and very low yields. They're moving into the business uh, of supplying the plastic waste. 
to the chemical recycling industry, but not taking part in the process. Uh, the European Chemical Recycling Association uh, actually proposes that there are much uh, higher yields and much lower waste streams. So the truth lies somewhere in between, but I would suggest that if major companies are pulling out, that they have their facts to hand. And I've mentioned before, it, and, and of course, not all plastic waste will be committed to chemical recycling, uh, and this is uh, taking the example to the extreme degree. But you can see how many additives are on the market on an annual basis and growing, and how much uh, the waste would be produced if they're stripped out of recycled polymers. So is this a savior technology or a cynical public relations ploy? Uh, another major company in Germany, a uh, consumer goods company, uh, quoted that because it has been proven to harm the climate and the environment, this would give the Minister of Economic Affairs in Germany a great opportunity to do something right for the environment and block a completely nonsensical, nonsensical technology, which is a pure lobbying project of the major plastic and chemical manufacturers. And that's, I think, which is that chemical recycling is essentially a fairy tale, a unicorn, uh, and uh, to be avoided uh, in favour of actually pursuing uh, real solutions to the plastic waste problem. Thank you. So we're going to open the floor for some questions and discussion. Um, I think the main element you heard is the amount of energy it takes to collect the plastic waste, begin to process the plastic waste into a chemical recycling facility, and then what are the outputs? So we're putting in chemicals in the plastic, we process that. Where is the impurities or the chemicals going? What are the accountability you're looking at? 22% uh, is a uh, 78 to 80% waste streams uh, to 30% waste streams. But if you put that into larger numbers, the whole plastic waste growth, they're quite significant, even at 10 to 30%. Um, and here we are at the Stockholm Convention, the Basel Convention, discussing plastic waste guidelines and seeing chemical recycling listed there, which is of concern to us because these are both highly technical. Conventions where you're dating parts per million at the same levels, as well as in the fact that you're looking at extreme uh, environment sound management technologies. Um, but this is obviously shown here not to be approved. Um, so, with that, we'll leave the floor open. And please, uh, we appreciate first that delegates from countries uh, would go first. Uh, we can be looking forward to that. And first, if there's any governments that would like to raise any question uh, or reflection of what they presented here, uh, please identify yourself. I'm from the UAE, and also uh, the Energy Executive and Residence at John Hopkins University in the United States. Um, I have an issue that you're presenting generally paralysis. You have not mentioned a lot about depolymerization, uh, which can yield BTS, benzene, tulamine, and xylene uh, into uh, a base chemical for reprocessing and melting in refrigerant, which has high efficiency. Uh, lots of different companies are investigating that. I know our university has a project that is successfully converting plastics three through seven into xylene with an input cost of around $200 and a sales price of $1,000 per ton. Uh, we use minimal energy, have very little offtake as far as gases, and we're being sponsored by the uh, Department of Energy. So, not a chemical company. So I'm, I'm wondering why you don't mention the alternatives to paralysis in greater depth, which have proven to be uh, successful in yielding a base chemical design, which is critical to the uh, manufacture of any plastic. Thank you for the question. Um, I know that you describe uh, the investigation that you're conducting as a project, uh, an investigation, uh, but not as a commercial scale reality. And I think that in most cases, uh, claims that have been made about the efficiencies uh, of depolymerization technologies are largely in that category. They're still in the investigation stage, the project 
the sage, the pilot the sage. We haven't seen that translate to large scale commercial reality at the moment. What we have seen uh, is that paralysis and gasification is receiving the bulk of the commercial funding. Uh, and we've already seen a lot of paralysis and gasification technology rolled out. Uh, and uh, in particular in Southeast Asia, there are a lot of uh, small scale and quite polluting uh, technologies uh, of that time. And so uh, what we're looking at is the sort of reality on the ground at the moment of what, what's being pushed. Maybe, maybe there is potential to scale up those types of more efficient technology. We'd like to see more about that. Uh, and we would like to uh, see whether it's successful or not. But at this stage, the data is extremely limited on those technologies and uh, the commercialization is in its infancy. And we can leave the floor open uh, for any, any delegate or individual that's any reflections or comments. Yes, so how does chemical recycling compare with incineration? Uh, there has been some recent life cycle analysis released uh, that purports to say that chemical recycling is slightly better on climate impacts than incineration, but largely that they're comparable in that respect uh, because of the large CO2 emissions from incineration from uh, non biogenic sources. However, um, from our point of view, both of the technologies are problematic uh, because of their UFOX generation. And it's not just UFOX, there's, there's a range of UFOX as many people are aware. So we, we regard them uh, as largely seen in the same character, in the same uh, category uh, from the point of view of generating hazardous waste streams and UFOX streams to either emissions or to their solid residues. Uh, we don't see a lot of difference between them on that. And apparently there's a slight difference in terms of carbon impact. Uh, but uh, again, a lot of the uh, carbon impact of uh, paralysis plants and gasification plants ignores the front end work, the pre-treatment that must be done to make the uh, plastic waste compatible with what such as it can be to their processes. And that includes cleaning, drying, and in some cases shredding, which are all energy consumption uh, processes that actually renders the, the carbon um, uh, footprint as, as negative in the sense of uh, energy generation. So there's more to it than just the actual process itself. It's what happens before and after. I mean, uh, again, in my uh, colleague and I, uh, in our publication on plastic waste management hazards, we, we touched upon that. Uh, and in some cases, uh, it sounds unusual, but landfill has been found in some life cycle analysis for plastic only, not to mix it with organic to be a more environmentally sound solution uh, uh, than either of those processes, simply because plastic on its own, uh, when it is stockpiled in that way, it doesn't, doesn't generate huge quantities of leachate, nor emissions, uh, and so on, and could be retained as a uh, resource for processing the later day when technology is improved. Any other questions? Okay, great. Before we move into the last presentation, there's just another taking into consideration what's happening here internationally. Uh, if there's some research, if there's some pilot projects happening, uh, why are these techniques being discussed uh, within the Basel Convention, the Stockholm Convention guidelines, and could it open the door <coughs> to the movement of plastic waste to be processed from one region to another? And that's a concern, especially with the amount of 
has been slowly being produced from these processes. We may be moving large amounts of plastics to get 22 to 87% yield uh, of the material, but then you're also generating large amounts of hazardous waste, which may be in low and middle income countries with limited capacity to manage that hazardous waste. Where does that hazardous waste end up? Who will be impacted by that hazardous waste? Are bigger questions and uh, things to be concerned with when we talk about guidelines here. Um, so, with this, we're going to transition into our last presentation um, from Lorian WR from Zero Waste Europe. This is a presentation a bit more focused uh, within the European context. I uh, was discussing this, and from that, I'm going to the um, the team to the Thank you. Thanks for joining me for this afternoon session. We can go a second. Let me first of all thank the organizers, Leah and Biden, for addressing you today to discuss chemical recycling and how to address the issue from an industry point of view. I work as a policy officer of chemical recycling and must say to show for Zero Sphere, which is the European network of Ghana. Zero Sphere is a European global NGO working with local groups and communities of different European countries, but also with the institution to shift to a more ambitious European policy when it comes to the provision of the environment and human health. Last year, in 2021, the European Environmental Agency stated that there is a significant lack of knowledge about the overall license and impact of chemical recycling on the environment. There are indications, however, that chemical recycling works only on the very specific and narrow condition, and it consumes energy, water, and chemical resources that increase the pollution of water and the air. Currently, the loss of recycling technology is the most to recycle plastic waste. And this technology are either defined or designated under the concept of chemical recycling, adverse recycling, adverse chemical recycling. And this sometimes to designate the same technology and sometimes not. So this creates a lot of confusion because we can see that, for example, pyrolysis and gasification or chemical depolarization are defined either by the concept of chemical recycling or advanced recycling, so it creates a lot of confusion for different stakeholders that are interested to invest or to follow the development of this technology. To avoid this confusion, we need to have a proper and formal definition of what chemical recycling is. And to be in line with the current choice carbon directive, we need to have a definition of recycling that does not include energy recovery and the processing into material uh, to be used as fuel or battery operation. So now, we can see already see the difference that we've been making between chemical recycling technology and chemical recovery technology. So, based on the different classification we make, we also classify them in the West in the West hierarchy. And therefore, as the place, the position in the West hierarchy is based on the overall environmental impact of this technology. Methane conversation will always be favored over chemical conversation because it has a reduced environmental impact compared to chemical conversation. We have here three same cases, but slightly differently. We can see that in more than two days, we have one more or less. The two, uh, the two first are designated as only simple cake, and the third one as the one cake. As a consumer, we want to buy and to eat a one cake with a certain amount of products to be sure that we are really buying what has been labeled. And so, this example. Is exactly the same when it comes to product level of this recycled material. We want to be sure, as a consumer, that we are buying a product that contains the exact amounts of recycled material that is labeled. That is labeled. So this cannot be ensured when using a flexible mass balance approach. Because it is a loose and flexible method that allows to, de to designate and to attribute a certain amount of recycled content to a produce. But in reality, it doesn't present this true amount of recycled content. 
journalists visit the face and so for sure to from personality when it comes to the separate context, there's different than the language that we can use. Even segregation, control blending, also called patch-level assets, also flexible assets. The segregation can be used when we have a common input. So we can see on the sides of the left one that there's separation between recycled material and the original material. Then, when it comes to chemical recycling technology, the new ones, it's defined as multiple inputs and recycling technology. Meaning, as you can see on the center of the site, so the control ending, that we will have a mix between recycled and reaching material. And the control blending methodology, also called bachelor mass science, will allow us to know the ratio, the ratio between inputs and outputs. Because we will ensure the highest traceability possible. And therefore, we know the exact amount of recycled content that we have at the end. As you can see on the corner, that is a mix between the orange and the green. So the proportion is known, and then after a reference proportion, the certification will be made and reflect the true recycled content of the product. But if we use a flexible mass balance approach, we will also in this case mix recycled the energy material, but we will not be able to know the proportion because there is not a physical separation and we can also so, so ensure the physical proportion of the sample content at the end. And this will come at the end of the question of the policy that we have on the other sites. Now, we have an application after the theoretical uh, explanation. As you can see, there are six similar products on the site. The papers are labeled based on their true amount of recycled contents. So they are sealed as the solid percent of recycled contents. The final three last, one of them is labeled as 100% recycled material. And the two others are labeled without any materials. This is based on the allocation that has been given to the products thanks to the flexible mass balance approach. And this would just allow for a marketing facility to be more suitable for us. Then, in reality, you don't have these products made. So, we are going to, have to ensure some facility and to ensure consumer trust when it comes to consumer to recycle contents to have a proper chemical rules between the input itself and the, the final products. So here you can see on the slide few policy recommendations as well as prior to the end. First, prior any financial incentives. We need to evaluate at the industrial level the environmental and health impact of the sectors. We also need to ensure that fuel pollution is excluded from the definition of recycling. Also to meet our ambitious our ambition when it comes to recognizing the society, this recycling process should keep at least 80% of the carbon contents of plastic waste when transforming it into the new products. We need also to ensure there is a legal certainty and clarification between all the different levels of the US hierarchy. And this also to avoid any competition with mechanical recyclable waste. And when it comes to the climate impacts of chemical recycling, a robust methodology should be developed to assess all the direct and indirect emissions caused by this new process. And now, when it comes to the outputs made from this new technology, it should be with an actual and strong trustability based on actual mass balance. And this output has to ensure to be toxic free. And 
all the sober of output has to have a lower environmental impact and a lower carbon footprint that's energy conserved.
and they want to put it into plastic products uh, as a way of, of redirecting their resources but maintaining their extraction and investment. The issue becomes then uh, that if uh, these pyrolysis and gasification technologies convert to a fuel oil, uh, those materials are then burnt uh, and it, you go back to the linear uh, process where they have to be extracted, converted into plastic again and then destroyed through these processes and so on. So uh, it's in their interest to maintain a, a linear model, even though they claim that this is in some way circular. Uh, it's unfortunate, uh, but it, it is a part of the business model, uh, and uh, the, the main thing they're trying to avoid is limits on production and extraction. So uh, I think also uh, there are uh, issues in, in terms of these technologies as well, uh, that uh, even if they're converted uh, to feedstocks, there are still emissions along the processing uh, pathway to produce uh, further plastics from them. Uh, it, it's not as if um, uh, the processes are somehow quarantined. Uh, they feed into refineries, refineries have substantial emissions, and it continues that entire uh, cycle uh, and the existing infrastructure processes uh, of the industry. Uh, and that's one of the, the biggest concerns for us. And I just may like to make a closing point. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you uh, for the presentation. And I would like to appreciate Hype and Geo Gaia for the continuous uh, side events on Plastic Forum. That is highly appreciated. And uh, very informative uh, presentation. My question is regarding uh, from Ms. Laurie. Whether the uh, chemical recycling of plastic by gasification as well as for pyrolysis is legally allowed in the EU, the first thing. And the second thing is, what is the uh, end use of products which they receive after the processing of uh, this plastic? And third thing, what type of waste of plastic because many types of plastic, so is there any categorization in Europe that they can take for the uh, recycling? Uh, this is my question. Thank you. Yes, thanks for the question. I'm not an expert on European uh, uh, regulatory practices, uh, but my understanding that it is legal to conduct these processes but also that uh, the majority of the output currently from the processes is directed to fuel uses uh, of one sort or another. Uh, and your, sorry, what was the last part of your question? What type of plastic waste? Yes, my understanding is that uh, mixed plastic waste is used uh, in terms of generating fuel, uh, but that if uh, the, output, if the intended output is to be a chemical feedstock, uh, then they have to have a much more refined input stream. So it has to be uh, limited to uh, relatively uh, narrow monomer uh, types. So they would be gaining for, I think, what you call post-production plastics, not post-consumer plastics, to try and achieve the high levels of purity in the process. So whether the final product of uh, fuel is acceptable to use in the Europe because in uh, uh, I think uh, there should be some further uh, purification of that oil. But in my point of view, as per my knowledge, that if we extract that uh, oil from this pyrolysis and gasification is not up to mark to use as fuel. Yes, I see your point. Uh, while it's legal to use it as fuel, it depends on the end use. So in some cases it's used for fairly crude uh, fuel applications like uh, bunker fuel uh, for shipping and that sort of thing. It's not suitable for use in vehicles. It's not suitable for use in uh, most energy generations like using sea gas for turbines, for electricity generation, because of the expense of cleanup necessary to bring it up to it. Uh, Specification standards. So, so yes, I understand what you're saying there, and, and um, 
it tends to be what the end user demands in, in respect of, of uh, the quality of the fuel. So while it's able to produce, um, it, m most applications are limited for it because of the contamination uh, that it contains. Thank you. Very good question. Thank you, uh, I can. The more you, you look at plastics, uh, you, the more you realize it's not inherently a circular material. And uh, we keep trying to take the square peg and throw, put it in this round hole and try to make it circular. For so many reasons, it just fails to be circular. And uh, the answer really lies in turning off the tap, turning off the production, and our three trees here today are not best suited for that. Um, certainly, we can reflect in the guidelines that we're creating that that should be emphasized, that the guidelines themselves should be prioritizing that as an issue of how to give guidance to parties to actually turn off the tap and reduce their dependency on uh, plastics. Uh, but there is a treaty coming where we will have that opportunity. The Global Treaty has to focus on turning off the tap because that's clearly the answer. Thank you. A very astute observation. And just uh, reflecting back to the previous comment as well, and, and, and your comment too, it is that uh, in Europe, uh, the use of fuel from these processes is not regarded as recycling. It's simply not because it's Merely returning the material to hydrocarbon forms and burning it. It's not a recycling process. And I think other countries would do well to uh, look at their legislation and how they treat this material in terms of the waste hierarchy. Uh, and, and I guess the final comment if there's any other question? Yeah, I just Uh, in other guidelines, like the pulse waste guidelines, 
Technologies have to pass a very, very strict process to be allowed to be a part of those guidelines. And they have to be backed by peer review citations and uh, proven performance characteristics. We haven't seen that yet. And that's one of the reasons uh, we believe that chemical recycling should not be included in the plastic technical guidelines at this stage. Perhaps it is something that may happen in the future if more information is available, but our suggestion is that that won't be the case. Uh, so I'd just like um, delegates and observers, parties, to reflect upon that uh, in our negotiations as we move forward.